I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Noble Women International. Are you ready for our teaching this morning? My name is Reverend Skyena Jermaine Mendron, all the way from Massachusetts, USA. Yes, you heard correctly. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor and a blessing to be with you today to teach you the word of God. And before we do that, um, I'm pretty much sure that Pastor Monica already introduced me. Um, some of you know about me. Um, let me just give you a brief background. Like I said, I am in Massachusetts, USA. I am a sister friend um, to Sister Marta Kasoa, who introduced me to Pastor Monica. And I am a wife. I am a mother of a eight year old, soon to be nine year old. I am 42 years old and I love the Lord. Um, he's my savior. He's my redeemer. He's my all in all. I just want to thank my husband, Harold, who is helping me. He does all my media. So if you're watching me or you're listening to me, um, it's because of him and I'm so thankful that God blessed me with such a wonderful man who is passionate about the work of Christ. His thing is media. So anything that have to do with media, that's what he does. Um, and I know in the future you'll get to see him, but right now he's behind the camera making sure that you're getting a good sound, you're getting some clear image. So um, before I introduce our lesson, um, I'm going to take a time. Remember, I'm going to be teaching. Some preaching might fall into there because um, the Holy Spirit has control of this. I've been praying and I'm pretty much sure that you have been praying. So I am so excited, Noble Women International, to be able to share God's word with you. Um, you might hear a little music. Um, when I go before the throne, um, I like to play like a little bit of, you know, instrumental, get your mind ready, get our hearts ready. I know that you guys been worshiping, you've been, you know, sharing your testimonies, but you know, now it's the time to proclaim the word of God. Um, and I always encourage you might be at work, you might be listening, wh wherever you are. I always encourage, if you are you are a noble woman, a noble woman means that you are a student of the word. Because it's the word of God. When you apply it to your life, that can declare you noble. So I always encourage that you get a pen <laughs> and a paper because we're going to do some teaching. And sometimes when you take notes, you remember things. You can go back and review your note. Because the whole purpose of the teaching and the preaching that you hear is for you to be able to apply it to your life. Because if you don't apply it to your life, it's not going to have any effect on you. Amen. So let us go before the throne of the Lord. And as we do that, get your Bible ready. Um, you can find me in the book of Ruth, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges. And after Judges, it's the book of Ruth. It's only four chapters. Don't worry, we're not going to go in it verse by verse. But we're going to be teaching the book of Ruth, but we're going to do it from Naomi's perspective and we'll get into the character when we begin our study. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We honor you, not because of what you've done, but because of who you are and you are God. You sit on the throne. Father God, I come standing in the line of prayer, standing in the line of thanksgiving, 
for my sisters, Lord God, who are in Africa right now, who are listening. And I know, Lord God, even here in the United States, some of our sisters going to get blessed through this word. Father God, we may be in different continent, but the fact that we are noble women, the fact that we are your daughters, we share the same spiritual DNA. Holy Spirit, we ask you to take control right now. Take control of this teaching. Take control of this fire conference, Father God. Take control of the mind and heart, Lord God, of everybody that's going to be listening to us wherever they are around the world. Take away any doubt, any anxiety, any worry, Lord God, that can hinder our spiritual ears to be open so we can hear from you, Father God. Lord God, I pray for this ministry. I pray for the pastor of this ministry, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you continue to strengthen her, Lord God. We thank you, Father God. We thank you because she answered the call. And I know it's not easy. Because there's discouragement that comes along our way. But Father God, you said that you renew our strength like the ego. So, Father God, allow all this woman, all the women within this network to always stay connected, Lord God, to always show Christ by their behavior, by their speech, and by the way they teach others. Father God, I pray. Holy Spirit, take control. Remove everything that is not like you. Lord God, decrease. And increase in me. Allow me Lord God. Use me to be a vessel. Use me to be a voice Lord God. As I'm speaking Lord God. Speak through me. Father God. So your children can hear from you. Not from me. Lord God. Take away any vain philosophy. But allow your daughters. Your children. To hear your voice. To this teaching. And we pray. Not because we are worthy, but we pray you in the matchless name of Jesus. To him be the honor and the glory, both now and forever. And say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Woo! Um, I know that sister, (laughs) Pastor Monica, um, said that I have an hour to an hour and a half. And when I heard that, I was really shocked. Because here in the U.S., um, it's rarely that they'll give a preacher 45 minutes on the pulpit. Because after 30 minutes, people just want to get up. But um, so I'm going to do the best I'm, I can. I can't guarantee I'm going to be here for an hour. But whatever time that we spend together, I know I'm going to be blessed. And you are going to be blessed also. Not because it's me presenting but it's because the, the word of God that's going to be thought today. So find yourself in the book of Ruth. So the book of Ruth, um, if you don't know, um, I'm going to give you a background. And there's some emotions as we do this teaching that I want you to pay attention to. It's only four chapter. It's a powerful, powerful story. That you can learn so many lessons from. I mean, you know, it's the story that show us the power of God. The power of family relationship. How to trust in God. His timing. His purpose. And the power of sticking together. As women of God. And I want to go because I study this book. So many times. But when I spoke to Pastor Monica and I was asking God to give me a word. And we're not going to go into it verse by verse, like I said, but we're going to go and use Naomi's perspective. Yes, it's the story of God's grace in the midst of difficult circumstances. And it's a love story. I mean, many women and, you know, I'm one of them. When we are single and not yet married, we always say we are waiting for our Boaz. Um, but there's two characters that the book mentioned the most. And the two characters are 
Naomi and Ruth. So this is what I want you to pay attention to. The emotions. So for chapter. Chapter one and part of chapter two talks about a mutual grief. A mutual grief between Naomi and Ruth. That's the background. Pay attention. Um, the second half of the second chapter. Um, talk about a mutual pursuit. And the last chapter, chapter four, talks about mutual love. And ladies, we all experience those emotions. Um, sometimes when, you know, things are happening in the midst of COVID, you know, we lost family and friends. Some of us lost the ability to gather together, you know, in a church. Um, but, you know, God always make a way. He send us virtual. This is why the technology is there for us. So we're going to use the technology to reach. Um, if you ever lost a loved one, if you ever had, your, you know, your heart broken, you experience grief. If you want to be, if you hear and you want to be there, that's a pursuit. And with the pursuit and you're pursuing something in life, you answering God's calling. You want to start a business. You want to start a ministry. You want your children to get from point A to point B to finish school. It's a pursuit. And life is always against you. And within that pursuit, there is anxiety. There is fear. There is disappointment. But let me tell you, the word of God said, whipping me in door for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So after all this, knowing that God is an anchor, he is a rock, he is a joy. And the word of God said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So we can rejoice even in the midst of difficulty. So throughout this book, there's grief, loneliness, companionship, and rejoicing. And the verse that I'm going to focus on, the fact that we're going to go from Naomi's perspective, and we found it in Ruth chapter 1. And we're going to go to verse 16 to 18. And it says, But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you, or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me. And more also. If anything but death. Parts you from me. Verse 18. When she. Naomi. Saw that she was determined. To go with her. She stopped. Speaking to her. So. Important factors that we want to get from this story. Naomi was living in a time of famine. So when this book was written, it was written during the time of the judges. So there were no mon a monarchy in Israel, only judges. Okay. And the judges, their role was to be the voice of God to continue to teach the children of God how to obey. But the fact that they were not doing what they were supposed to do. So there was a famine that came to Bethlehem. And Bethlehem means the house of bread. So now, Naomi, her husband, and her two sons. Naomi's husband was only mentioned in the beginning. His name was Elimelech. His name means God is king. His, her two sons, Malin. And Killian, both name means sickly and failing. So Naomi and Elimelech decided that they're going to leave Bethlehem and that they're going to go to the land of Moab 
to find new life because of the famine in Bethlehem. But in the pursuit of a better life, this is where Naomi lost everything. She lost her husband. She left. She lost her two sons. But her two sons were already married. And one of the sons were married to Ruth. So, and then the two, the wives of the son were Moabites. So it doesn't prevent Jewish men or is to marry Moabite women. But they said they can't do it until the 10th generation. Okay. So now they went there. They married those women who are not from the tribe. Who are not Israelite, but Moabite. So Naomi was living in a time of famine. She relocated to Moab with a husband in search of a better life. And where she was going, where she went to look for a better life, this is where she lost everything. Her husband died first. Then 10 years later, her two sons were killed. Now, Naomi knew God. She had a relationship with God. She trusted God. But when she started losing everything, who did she blame? She blamed God. So sometimes, you know, theologian will refer to the book of Ruth to Naomi as the female Job. Because remember, Job was a just man. He lost everything. Just like Naomi was a noble woman, but she lost everything. And I can tell you why. Um, in verse 20, the first chapter, if you look at it, um, she decided that she was going to go back home to Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. After she lost everything, she said she's going to go back. And the verse that we read earlier, these are the verses because the fact that her two sons had died, the women were free, according to, to Jewish law, the, the, women's, the women were free to go and marry anybody else they wanted to. One left, not that she was a bad woman. They didn't have children, so there was no kingship. But Ruth, before, because she was following Naomi, and because Naomi was such a noble woman, she told Naomi, look, wherever you go, I'll go. Your God will be my God. She didn't have to serve the God of Israel. So when she persisted, Naomi said, okay, I'm not going to fight with you. She followed because Naomi did not want her to go. There was no other son. Because according to Jewish law, if you married, there's three brothers. One brother died. The wife of the brother that died is married, can marry the second one if he died until there's kingship. But it wasn't so. So when Naomi returned back to Bethlehem and the people were so happy to see her. And then she told them in verse 20, don't call me Naomi. She told them, call me Mara because the almighty has made my life very better. The same God she trusted is the same God she blamed. I don't know if you can relate, but I can relate to that. Because sometimes when suffering and anxiety and trouble and tribulation come our way and we say, God, why me? Why me? I pray. I fast. I give my offering. I pay my tithe. I, I evangelize. Why all those things are coming to me? Hey, let me ask you this question. Why not you? Why not me? Because God commanded us to rejoice even in our trial and tribulation. Because it's going to pers- produce perseverance and perseverance will produce hope and when you have hope in God because our hope is the anchor of our faith and without hope who can live another minute 
So now back to Ruth. She had lost faith, but she had no idea. Oh, hallelujah. That God works in mysterious ways. She has no idea that a ray of hope will show up through her relationship and her love for Ruth. Sometimes you might see that your case is dead. Your situation is dead. But let me tell you, God is able to breathe life to those dry bones, your dry circumstances. God is able to revive them. Unless God says so, hold on to his unchanging hand because he works in mysterious way. He's going to bring help from a way that you never thought or think or even imagine. Because this is how he works. So, after the loss of the husband and the two sons, it would be best for her to go back to Israel. Orpha did not go. The other lady did not go. She stayed in Moab to remarry. But Ruth, did a selfless act. Not only that Naomi allowed Ruth to feel her pain when she lost her son, but also to see and feel joy. So the relationship was not easy. This joy, this suffering, remember of the emotions even though she rejoiced in her relationship with God, but also she suffered. So because of that, Ruth and Naomi formed a strong bond with God at the center. In the relationships that you have, even within the Noble Women International Ministry, is God in the center of that relationship? I know some of you, yes, this is a ministry. I want to get the most out of it. But sometimes our selfishness, our motivation, even though we're doing the right thing, but our motivation can be wrong. So Ruth was able to see Naomi as a type of woman that can help her to fulfill her destiny. A type of woman that can push her towards her destiny. She didn't know what was waiting for her in Bethlehem. She didn't know going back to Israel. She didn't know what was waiting for her. But she knew if Naomi is that type of of a noble woman. And she's a servant of the most high God. Something good has to come out of it. So you see God's plan. Even though he used one people, the Israelite, he used them to bring forth a savior. But the plan was always for Jews and Gentile to be reconciled back to God. And if you know the story, Ruth became the great grandmother of David and Jesus. It's from the lineage of David. So, let's find out, since we got the most important points out of the way. Let's find out, why was Ruth so faithful to Naomi? Number one, Ruth was drawn to Naomi because the way Naomi lived her life according to God's standards. Even though Naomi became the lowest form in Jewish society, a widow who has no children, she had no kingship, and everything was about kingship. 
Naomi was selfless and was quick to consider the needs of others. She told Ruth, I have nothing to offer you. I have no more son. I'm by myself. I have no redeemer. I'm just going to go back home and live the rest of my days. She did not tell her to come. She said, you're still young. You can still marry somebody from Moab. You don't have to follow me. She told them that. Because think about it. Some mother-in-law, huh? they would say, you know what? You are married to my son. You tied to me for life. Now I have no one. It's you that I have. But she let them go. She let them go. She gave up the security of family to learn from Naomi. Let me ask you this, ladies. Is your behavior as a Christian woman, as a noble woman, are you influential enough to have people not follow you for fame that you can have such an impact on somebody's life because the way you act, the way you speak, even though the per- you live your life as a living testimony and people would come up to you and say, you know what? I don't know. What sister so-and-so is serving. But I want to know that God. And that person will come to faith because of you. Listen, and you know, when you evangelize, it's not when you hold on to a microphone and you go in door to door. And tell people, repent. God is coming. Christ is coming. Repent so you can inherit inter- eternal life. The best form. That you can evangelize is by your character, is by your attitude, and the way you treat others. Because you can say to everybody, I'm all that. But if your character and your behavior don't reflect, you are lying. You are lying. You can fool humans, but you can't fool God. Your true self will eventually show out. So that's a warning to you ladies. So. We saw that. Why Ruth was so faithful to Naomi. Because Naomi led by example. She did what she had to do. And I'm pretty much sure even though the the the. The story doesn't go into detail. But you can tell that she was a faithful servant. She was a a woman of noble character. That she took care of her son. She took care of her goddaughter. She took care of what God entrusted her with. Where are you in this? One of the reasons why I love this book, it's one of two books in the Bible that you see God from a woman's perspective. Most of the Bible were written by men. Samuel, the prophet Samuel wrote this book, but he wrote it from Ruth's perspective. I mean, from Naomi's perspective. And this is the first time we get to see that. I know you heard about the woman and the the, the noble woman in Proverbs 31. Ruth, Naomi, exemplify that woman. Naomi did it so well that somebody came to faith because of her own faith in God. So, how do we apply this to our life, ladies? And if you hear a message, a sermon, unless you apply it to your life, 
It's like you did nothing. One ear out of the other. The word of God is powerful. This is what it says. Piercing. Bones and marrow. Discerner of thoughts. And when the word of God touched you, it propelled you to respond. And the way you respond is by applying. We call that in theology application of the word. When you start applying it to you, like your life, this is when you're going to bear fruit. Because let me tell you something. The devil knows the word of God. <laughs> because this is what he used to tempt you. It's not a lack of knowing, but he uses it out of contest. So unless you know it, You'll be able to discern the will of God. You'll be able to discern true teaching and false teaching. So, let's get into this application. Ladies, it's time for us to start reaching out to one another. Listen to me. It's time for us ladies to start reaching out to one another if we if i haven't done so if you haven't already done so we must learn to know how to relate to one another yes i may be in the usa you may be in Malawi, you may be in South Africa, you may be, I know that I'm going to have some sisters even from Haiti listening to this. Wherever you are, the fact that you proclaim that you are a child of God, we have to learn to relate to one another. Here in the U.S., when I go to the grocery store with my husband, sometimes we go together or we go shopping or walking down the street, whatever we're doing. If a man is coming by the opposite way, I always observe the two of them say, hey, what's up, bro? How you doing, bro? And then women, we pass each other all the time. We never say hi. And I'll turn around and I ask my husband, do you know this guy? He's like, no, I don't know him. He's a man. We relate. He might never see that person again. But here in the U.S., women, I think women all over the world, we see each other, even at the church. If the person is not your friend, sometimes you walk in and you don't even, you don't even say good morning, good afternoon, God bless you, have a blessed day. We don't even say that. Sometimes you know why we're afraid to relate to one another? Because we're afraid of what people might find out of how they might see us. It's okay to admit our weaknesses. I know it's okay. The word of God said when you are weak, this is when he's strong. It's okay to admit to your fears. It's okay to admit to your loss of faith. Sometimes you, sometimes you can't, like, it happens to me. Not because I'm not in touch, not because I'm not a believer. But sometimes you get to a point that you can't even pray for yourself. The things that you're going through become so overwhelming that you can't even pray. This is what it says. Sometimes we don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Holy Spirit intercede on our behalf. It happened to the best of us. That's what makes us human. God know that we were going to go through trials and tribulation. He said, do not be afraid. Fear not. Do not be troubled. Do not be anxious about anything. Because he knows as human beings, he, we created with that fear. He created us with that fear. He tell us not to fear because we, he doesn't want this fear to overpower. Because when you let fear overpower you, you become paralyzed. You might be able to walk physically, but spiritually you become paralyzed. That's what it says in Timothy 
God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of love and of sound mind. So it's okay. It's okay to be transparent. Even within your network of Noble Women International, find two or three women in bond. In bond. It's always good to have a prayer partner. Because when you are transparent, it helps you build relationship and it helps the relationship to be stronger. Naomi did all these things and Ruth was still drawn to her. Can you imagine? You left your country to go in search of a better life for your whole family. And then when you got there, you lost everything. That must have been horrible. I don't know what, what thing you lost if it's a child, a family member. But let me tell you, God is a restorer of all things. He will restore you. He is near the brokenhearted. This is what he says. Don't lose faith. When you feel like you can't pray, call a sister. Say, sister, I, I need to pray, but I can't pray. Can you pray with me? And all those things that Naomi went through, Ruth was still drawn to her. Because of that, this gave Naomi the opportunity to help Ruth reach her destiny. And we said that in the beginning. The destiny that God has created her for. Through Naomi's selfishness, she was blessed. In chapter 3 verse 11, let me read to you what it says. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people in my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Now, this is Boaz ha, talking up to Ruth. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. So even the guardian knew Ruth was a woman of noble character. You know why? Even though she would get up every morning, she would go to the field and she'll collect things. Because in Jewish law, and you can read about it in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, if you have a field, a garden, when you harvest, you don't harvest everything. You have to leave some on the threshold for the widows and the orphan. So she was there, diligent. Because she knew the law, even though she wasn't Jewish. She knew the law. So, God took her from poor to prosperous. From famine to harvest. Hallelujah. I don't know where you are. You might be poor spiritually. You might be poor physically. You might be poor in terms of money. But let me tell you this. God can take you from that to prosperity. And sometimes when we talk about prosperity, we always, most of us, we equip prosperity with having money. We equip prosperity with having a big business. But let me tell you, if you have good health, you have a place to sleep, roof over your head, you have food on your table, let me tell you, this is prosperity. You know and I know, wherever we are in the world, there are people, even here in these United States, that are begging, that are sleeping in the cold. We need to stop equating wealth with prosperity. 
Because let me tell you, if you're not a good steward of the little thing that God give you, do you think he's going to bless you with a lot? Sometimes God just give us what we need. He's a Jehovah Jireh. He provide. He would give you enough that you need to keep you humble sometimes. So think about it. He can take you from famine, spiritual famine, or even physical famine to harvest. Naomi was running from a famine. She lost everything and returned back. And God restored her. So as women, we must be willing to heed the cries of our sisters. We must be willing to have our ears open to hear their cry and answer them and stop being judgmental. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? Because sometimes we are so competitive with each other. We say, I love you, my sister, but yet we are so competitive. We need to stop doing that. And the last thing, and I already mentioned it, rid ourselves of competitive spirit. Listen, it is a race. Paul described the Christian journey as a race, a marathon. Not a sprint, but a marathon. And to run the race, you must treat the body. If you are a runner, you know there's certain things that you cannot eat. You try to eat a healthy diet. And when you're running, you don't run with heavy clothes. You run with light clothes because you, you don't run with a big backpack. You have to be light. So even in our Christian journey, we need to feed our souls with spiritual food, meaning studying God's word, praying for each other, getting rid of competitive spirit because those are the things that's going to hinder you because those things become heavy weight on your back and you cannot walk. Yes, it's a marathon, but I'm not running against you. I'm running for the high prize that is in Christ Jesus, not against you. For as iron sharpen iron so sisters can help sisters grow in the walk of faith. Hallelujah. We must work not only to rid ourselves of competitive spirit, but we must work on raising more Naomi's. Are you leaving behind a legacy starting in your family, your daughters, your nieces? Hallelujah. The young ladies in your assembly, in your church, are you able to make an impact on their lives? Do you judge them when they don't dress accordingly? Or do you take them by the side and give them wise counsel? We have a lot of work to do, ladies, starting with me. So, what must we do as women of God? <laughs> Ruth and Naomi helped each other. Yes, they did. They sure did. When Naomi felt like she was in her darkest hour, Ruth refused to leave her. The word of God said a friend stick closer than a brother. How many sisters have you left in the darkest hours? You might be one of the sisters that somebody else left in your darkest hours. Let me tell you this. God never, absolutely never give you more than you can bear. Things might be dark. Whipping may endure for a night. But let me tell you, sisters, joy comes in the morning when it's the darkest hour in the middle of the night. You can rejoice because daytime is coming. 
God is not like men. He cannot lie. So because Ruth refused to leave her in her darkest hour, Ruth was able to fulfill the destiny that God created her. Put a Gentile in the line huh, of the Savior of Jesus Christ. We each have a calling on our lives. If you don't know your call, if you don't know your purpose, you need to ask yourself these questions. And they are, what was in God's mind when he created me? Ask yourself that question. Why did God created me? What am I supposed to be doing? Where am I supposed to be doing it? And whom am I supposed to be doing it for? Because once you enter the kingdom, once you become adopted in, into God's family, he gives you a purpose. You have a calling. Have you entered to the calling? Some of us, we stubborn. It took me more than seven years to answer to mine. Pastor Monica said eight years, God put this ministry on our heart. But let me tell you, you don't have to wait that long. Do what you need to do. And if you don't know, ask God. As you ask yourself this question, ask God, the Holy Spirit, to reveal to you what you need to be doing. Because our job, we have a calling to advance the kingdom of God by helping God's children. God is spirit. Amen. He doesn't have hands and feet. So we are his ambassadors. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his voice. So let's be like Naomi. The same way that Naomi exemplified a woman that was committed to helping someone in need. Number two. Whew. Again, relate. Relate to one another. Relate. Continue to meet. In Hebrew chapter 3 verse 13 it says, But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Listen, when you don't encourage each other, when you don't pray with each other, guess what happened? You start to isolate yourself. The further you are from the Bible, the closer you are to sin. The closer you are to God's word, the furthest away. Furthest away you are from sin. That's what it says that you may be hardened, that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Because guess what? When you start f falling away, backsliding, you don't have time to attend the studies anymore. You don't have time to attend fire conferences anymore because your sin are consuming your life. And I don't know what sin you're struggling with. I only know mine. <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. This is the time to confess. First of all, confess to the Most High God. Because he said, if you confess your sin, I am just enough to forgive your sin and all your iniquities. But guess what we have to do? It's not like he doesn't know that we sin. He said we must confess. Because when you confess, you have to verbalize the very thing that you're doing. Not just saying, God, I'm sorry. But you have to name it. Name it. And repent. And have an accountability partner, a sister that you can talk to and say, this is what I'm struggling with. Pray for me. Hold me accountable. We need to start holding each other accountable, not judgmental, but holding each other accountable. We know a tree by its fruit. Amen. Amen. In Galatians 5, it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, 
um, kindness, long suffering, self control, goodness. When you walk to a mango tree, you know it's a mango tree. You walk to an orange tree, you know it's an orange tree because there's an orange there. We are not called to judge, but we are called to inspect. So when you hold your sister accountable, you become a fruit inspector. You said you're a noble woman, but yet you hate your sister. You say you're a noble woman because your sister was able to achieve this. Instead of you congratulating that sister, guess what you do? You become jealous. You go behind that sister, you're like, oh, she thinks she's something. We are all in the same boat. No man is an island. No woman is an island. Just like it says in Hebrew chapter 313. Encourage another daily. Encourage them. If they are doing something good, encourage them. Don't give up hope, sister. You can do it. You can get that business off this ground. You can get that ministry going. I will help you. I will make phone calls for you. A lot of the time, we don't work with each other. Be loving to one another. Show the power of God through the life that you live in. I said that so many times throughout the teaching. Let your light shine. You are the salt. Wherever you come, a food with no salt, you're supposed to give it flavor. God used Naomi to bless the world by being in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And you know why I said he blessed Naomi? Because Naomi blessed Ruth. God wants to use you too. Our blessing may not come to us the way we think it will. Our blessing can be passed down from other people, from other family members. Our blessing can come to a future generation that's going to be saved because of your legacy. Be the kind of woman that God chooses you to be. And in closing, the book of Ruth came along at a time of irresponsible living in Israel. This is why there was a famine. Because every time, every time the children do good, God reward them. When they stray away, God punish them. And appropriately, God always called the people back to a greater responsibility and faithfulness. This is why he put the restriction to call them back to repentance. Even in difficult times, God is still in the midst of your situation. Maybe he's trying to get your attention. Maybe he's trying to bring you to repentance. Maybe he's trying to push you to do the, same, the very thing that he called you to do. So just like he applied to the children of Israel, Back then, this call applied just as clearly to us today. We belong to a loving, faithful, and powerful God who has never failed. He has never failed to care for you. He has never failed to provide for his children. David said, I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. Because God is faithful. When we are not, he's faithful. That's his, that's his nature. He cannot change. He's a provider. A Jehovah Jireh. A healer. A Jehovah Rapha. A banner. A Jehovah Nisi. 
When we think that we, we have sleepless nights, he, uh, he's a Jehovah Shalom. He give us peace. He's a mighty warrior. He fight our battles. Like Ruth and Boaz. When they join together at the end of the book. We are called to respond to that divine grace. Of faithfulness. And obedience. In spite of this godly culture that we live in. The things that we are seeing, sometimes we ask ourselves, God is coming soon. Jesus is coming back soon. We are living the last day. In spite of the godless culture we live in, God called us. We must respond to his divine grace and faithful obedience. We say that faithful obedience, not when you feel like it, but faithful obedience. So let me challenge you, my noble sisters. Are you willing to step to the challenge? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that we just shared. We pray right now, Lord, for anybody that's going through something. That they may feel like they are in the dark, darkest hour. That you raise Roots and Naomi's to stay by them. To encourage them. Lord God, allow them to know that you are faithful. That you are there even in the midst of the loneliness, the grief, the loss. That they can rejoice because our Redeemer lives. Father God, I thank you for everyone at the sound of my voice. That you would bless them tremendously. Some of us needs to be broken and rebuilt. You are the potter, we are the clay, Lord God. Mold us in the way you want us to be. Renew our mind, renew our spirit. Take away any spirit of competitive, any spirit of jealousy, anything that is not like you. That we can be strong sisters, truthful sisters, transparent sisters in Jesus' name. Father God, we ask that you continue to bless this ministry and to enlarge our territory, the territory of this ministry worldwide. Father God, we pray that you continue to bless our Pastor Monica to continue to give us strength and wisdom and discernment to lead your people. We pray, not because we are worthy, but we praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. From Massachusetts, USA, this was your sister, Skyena German Mandron, who shared the word with you. Be blessed and hope to see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one.